I'm Wesley and this is my channel 22 zines. Today I am going to be making my debut video for the tarot tube community. I am very interested in tarot, very obsessed with tarot. I write uh, like 90% of my zines probably have something to do with tarot. Um, and there was this tag that a tarot tuber created um, Simon at the Hermit's Cave created this. It's called Tarot Tubers A to Z. And I just thought it would be a great little get to know you thing as a way of branching into tarot a little bit. But, you know, while, while some of the questions do have to do with tarot, a lot of them don't and are a little just more about me. So I figured it'd be a nice way to introduce myself both for zinesters and tarot stirs alike. Um, there are 26 questions, one for each letter of the alphabet, so I'll just get started. A is age, I am 24. B is your favorite book, and I have the book that I usually tell people is my favorite book, um, and then I have my actual favorite book. Uh, one of the ones that I usually tell people is my favorite is the Phantom Tollbooth by Norton Juster. Or, yes, by Norton Juster. Jesus. I was thinking of the uh, the artist Jules Pfeiffer. Anyway, um, I do really love this book. And it's one of those ones that has been with me since childhood. As you can see, this is a very well-read copy. And, of course, it will always have a special place in my heart. But I don't find myself rereading it very often. To be honest, I don't find myself rereading a lot of books. There's a select few that I really enjoy rereading. But as far as what my actual favorite book is, if I have to be honest about it, is probably the Scott Pilgrim series, which, you know, it's a series of six graphic novels. So I guess that's cheating in two regards. It is a series of six books, and they are graphic novels, which I know is... I mean, I will always defend graphic novels as definitely being books, and they definitely count in the category, but, you know, maybe not what people were thinking by this. Anyway, I just really like this. It is one of the first books and one of the first um, series, I guess, that I just really... really made me feel like an adult. <laughs> really, really caught me up. It's kind of funny how that... how the Phantom Tollbooth is really... Uh, reminiscent of me as a kid and me being a kid and then Scott Pilgrim is really reminiscent of me finding my voice as a teenager and as an adult. Um, anyway, so Scott Pilgrim series definitely. C is career, um, both what I wanted to do as a kid for a career and what it actually is today. I always as a kid thought that I wanted to be a writer of some kind and I kind of am a writer now in the sense that I do zines, but, you know, that's a hobby. And I, when I got older, I just realized I really did not want to do freelance or self-employment, at least not as my primary form of making money, um, because I really like the structure of a nine to five day. And I just know that it would be way too hard for me to create my own structure every single day. Not to mention the whole hustling for work thing. It's really tough. Um, and I didn't really want to do journalism, which is kind of, you know, one of the, <laughs> one of the primary ways that um, writers can have a sense of a nine to five structure, you know? Anyway, what I actually am today, I'm a librarian. Um, I work at a public library here in Boston, and I am going to library school working on my master's degree, and I really hope to continue working in public libraries for my career. D is dream. Um, like, what is my dream? And I guess this one's just going to go kind of deep right off the bat. I really want to be more self-confident and self-assured in a way that doesn't center around what I can produce. I love making zines. I love making art. I love work <laughs> and I love creating. 
Um, but at the same time, I feel like it can kind of be a crutch where this is what my identity becomes. And if I'm not actively creating something, if I'm not constantly creating something, I feel like I'm not doing enough. I have a really hard time just relaxing, you know, and not doing something productive. Um, even though intellectually, you know, I, I'm very anti-capitalist, and so it's just really hard, you know. I have this zine, actually, you know, I wasn't planning on talking much about this, but I have it right here, and so I'm going to bring it out. It's called Anti-Capitalist Affirmations by Nick Moreno. It is really, really good. I highly recommend it for anybody who's has a similar dream to mine, um, and it's basically just, you know, a whole bunch of a whole bunch of affirmations that it's okay to exist as a person without being capitalist <laughs> or, or without succumbing to what capitalism wants you to believe. Um, like here's one of them. You are not born to just go to work, pay bills and die. You are allowed to have hobbies and interests that enrich your life without selling the products from them. Hobbies are meant to give your life quality and joy, not monetary value. So, clearly I need to repeat some of these to myself, but, you know, highly recommend picking this one up. Okay. <laughs> e is essential item. And for me, I don't know if this counts as cheating because it's technically two items, but pen and paper, always. I have to have pen and paper or just some method of writing things down, and I usually prefer writing things down on paper because if I write it digitally it just gets lost so much easier. Um, I really need a place to take notes and write down my thoughts or else I just try to keep all of them in my head 24-7 and it really doesn't work. Um, I think pretty much the only time that I don't have a pen and paper with me or you know nearby enough is when I'm taking a walk and it's just because it's kind of too cumbersome. I've kind of been thinking about trying to get a pocket notebook for that, but at the same time, I usually am out on a walk with my dog and it's sort of hard just to stop and write while I'm walking him. Um, but yeah, anyway, <laughs> I have to be able to write things down because I, you know, write down ideas for zines or just personal feelings that I want to come back to or whatever. I've always been a journal person. Okay. <laughs> F is my favorite RWS deck, or Rider Waite Smith, for people who aren't really in the tarot community. That is just the <laughs> the classic tarot deck. When you think when you think of tarot, you're probably thinking of these images. Uh, my favorite um, RWS deck, or or version of the classic RWS, which I assume is sort of what this means, is not talking about something that uses the RWS system but just, you know, is a, a rendition of the classic Pamela Coleman Smith images. My favorite is the 1909 reproduction of the Roses and Lilies deck. This I got from drive Through Playing Cards, or drive Through Cards, whatever it's called, um, and it is basically a very painstaking um, reproduction of the original art trying to be as conservative as possible in cleaning and restoring it, but also, oh, I should hold this to the other side, um, you know, making it print worthy. So just, you know, just trying, trying to bring it up to, um, their former glory. And so a lot of these, they have, you know, they have the original text the original in the original handwriting, there's a lot of, um, you know, the, the bleed and the sort of, what would you call it? Like, like the color, what do you call it? It's like, uh, block printing. It's like the, you know, the bleed that you get from block printing and, you know, this, my lighting situation does not do this justice in terms of the colors, but it's so nice. It's such a soft version and it has so much texture. In fact, I'm going to show off this hermit card a little. You can really see a lot of the texture. 
Let's see if I can get it to focus better. Um, whatever you can you can see that there's there's a lot more texture on the backs, and this is because they're trying to um, reproduce the artwork as it was originally printed, like on the paper it was originally printed. The cards themselves are really smooth um, and and pretty thin, but sturdy, easy to shuffle. Um, just really nice card stock and. I just love it. Oh, of course, I I happen to pull or, you know, open up to the Six of Cups, which is one of my favorite cards, and I just really like it. Here are the backs, the original Roses and Lilies backs. I think that this was just really well done. It's completely beautiful. I like it better than the Centennial. I am very picky <laughs> about Rider Waite decks. I generally... Um, I mean, I'll just leave it at that because I don't want to get too much into it. I'm already at a long, many, many minutes here. But anyway, yes, I highly recommend this. It's the 1909 Roses and Lilies reproduction from Drive Through Playing Cards, or that you know you can order on Drive Through Playing Cards. Okay, G is gold or silver. <laughs> I guess um, gold in general, but I don't think there's anything wrong with silver and I don't see anything wrong with using both in an outfit or piece of art. So yeah, H is height. I am five foot four, so I'm a manlet. I is your ideal day and um, it's funny that I mentioned earlier that my dream was to be less concerned with being productive because right now my ideal day is probably going to conflict with that a little bit. Um, what would be absolutely perfect is just a nice rainy day. I love the rain. Um, just sitting and being able to spread out a lot of my work, a lot of my books, a lot of my art, just whatever I'm doing in either a coffee shop or at a library and just be able to look out the window and listen to the rain coming down and just really engage with whatever um, creative project or whatever study I'm doing at the time. <laughs> and um, well, let's see what else. Listening to some new wave or, <laughs> or goth music on some headphones and just really, really get into my zone, you know, and I just totally get that, that afterglow after a job well done, you know what I mean? So that would be my ideal day. J is jokes or a joke. Um, I don't really have a lot of jokes that I do off the cuff. I will sometimes have some I mean I don't know that I'm an especially funny person I'm sorry like I'll sometimes have some funny or kind of important things to say I guess if I have someone to play off of you know <laughs> like I can I can usually bring something pretty substantial to someone else's joke um I guess you would call that transubstantiation K is kids um do you like them do you want them I I do like them and I do want them. Um, I do plan with, like, my boyfriend and I, we do plan on adopting or birthing some children in the future at some point. I, you know, have a hard time managing large groups of children, but everyone does. So, yeah, I'm very love kids, pro kids. L is living arrangements. Right now, I am renting an apartment with my boyfriend, Sean, and um, my younger sister and his younger brothers. Um, so it goes pretty well, and I really like this place. We each have our own bedroom, you know, Sean and I share, but it's, you know, a pretty nice place. We've got some really great neighbors. Um, everyone's very trans and gay friendly, 
except uh, <laughs> that we have a church that is right below us and it's a pretty shitty church. Um, they moved in after we did, which really kind of sucks, you know? Um, but they, they are so loud and are just very entitled and generally real assholes. So we're actually planning on ordering, or sorry, we ordered some pride flags and we're planning on hanging them up in the windows just to kind of piss them off. So here's hoping that works. M is favorite Marseille deck, um, which is another style, uh, you know, a, cl a classical tarot deck for those who aren't familiar. And my favorite Marseille deck is not especially classical. I believe this is my only Marseille deck and probably the only one that I am especially interested in getting. It is the Trionfi della Luna. <laughs> really great. I love this more than the Deviant Moon. I don't actually have the Deviant Moon. Like, I just don't like the art as much. Um, it's kind of funny that this has sort of a similar art in terms of the sort of offset block-like printing and um, <laughs> just like the, the the way that the line art is done, I feel like is very similar to the 1909 Roses and Lilies. But yeah, geez, how do people hold tarot decks up to these cameras? They're so hard to, <laughs> so hard to maneuver. Um, but yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> I actually, I like the pips. I feel like you can actually get kind of a lot from them. Like, um, just from the little details and the little stylistic things, like, um, this big eye in the center surrounded by the foliage for the Ten of Coins or Ten of Pentacles, I totally get the Rider weight idea of, um, generational and sort of, I guess the eye just sort of reminds me of, like, watching over your future generations, um, and there's definitely a lot of abundance in the leaves compared to some other ones. Like, um, here's the five and you can see that there's just the flowers and the leaves and things seem a lot thicker in this deck. I don't know. I just, I like it. I love the art style. I read pretty well with it. Apparently it's rumored that the artist is going to eventually release a fully illustrated miners version of this deck, which I would absolutely be getting. And at that point, I don't know if that it, uh, you know, one of these with fully illustrated miners really counts as Marseille. But anyway, yeah, Triumphi del Luna. N is nicknames. Um, my nickname used to be Wesley, uh, <laughs> even <laughs> before I transitioned, just because I kind I made up the name for myself and <laughs> it turns out that I'm trans and now it's my real official name so I don't have a nickname anymore. <laughs> Maybe I could use my dead name as a nickname. That would suck. O is for oracle decks and my favorite oracle deck. I don't really like oracle decks. I'm really much more of a tarot person because I like the structure and I like how it's sort of the knowledge is transferable between decks and it just um I feel a lot more connection with the sort of the history about it. I really love learning about historical decks and you know really old structures and and how the tarot system has evolved. I just feel like a lot of that is kind of missing from oracle decks. Um but the one that I have, the only oracle deck that I have and one that I really like is the Oracle of the Radiant Sun. Um I made this little box for it just out of cardboard and paper. Um, and this is an oracle deck that's centered on astrology. And so, of course, that one's going to be appropriate for me because it is something that already has a very historically, um, whatever, a very historic system. Um, with a lot of uh, internal structure for the deck. Um, I really like it. And let me just hold this up a little better. Eat, I should hold it on this side. Uh, I haven't figured out how to hold cards yet to the camera. Please ignore that. Um, but basically each card um, has 
the uh, planet that it represents. So it's sun, moon, and then the... Uh, so it has the seven classical planets. So it has sun, moon, uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. So it doesn't have the outer, outer, outer planets. Um, and then it has the sign. So basically it's like the sun in Cancer and the key word for it is resourcefulness. Um, and it's really elegant system and um, if you're looking for an or if, if you're looking to learn more about astrology then this might be a nice way to to branch into it. I really like using this deck to cast people's charts um, or cast my own chart just because I feel like it's a lot easier to um, to research and to kind of have everything all in one place and you can, it's a little easier to see the overarching themes than um, if you're just looking at the chart. At least it is for me now because I'm still a relative beginner, I guess novice as opposed to beginner astrologer. Um, so anyway, yes, Oracle of the Radiant Sun, really like this one. P is for something that I am passionate about. And this is kind of a hard one. I actually, I prepared, you know, prompts for, I prepared my answers to these prompts for most of these. And I didn't prepare this one just because it's really hard to narrow down. I guess I would say I'm passionate about accessibility and I'm going to go with that one. <laughs> I'm passionate about accessibility and that means a lot of things. It means accessibility for people of all abilities in sort of a, in a physical sense, like, um, or in a practical sense, I guess you would say. So things like, um, braille options or audio options for people who are, uh, blind or, you know, closed captioning for people who are deaf or hard of hearing and um, accessibility of ASL interpreters or whatever your regional sign language is. Um, that's really important to me. And um, web design, this comes up a lot in web design, actually. Um, I get really annoyed with some with shit web design or stuff that's that's not accessible online. And it really annoys me because people talk about the internet as being kind of an equalizer and it really isn't. <laughs> it really isn't at all. Um, anyway, so that's really important to me, but also accessibility of information. And so that, so that's obviously includes physical accessibility of information. Audiobooks are really important. Brailing services are really important, but also just Accessibility regardless of income level, accessibility regardless of class or regardless of race or gender. So, you know, it encompasses inclusivity. Um, one thing that I'm really passionate about is bringing this sort of, bringing the walls down and bringing the barriers down for academic level information. Like it really annoys me how much amazing information there is out there, how many amazing articles, how much how much knowledge is out there that you just can't access unless you are somehow affiliated with a higher learning institution. And that, you know, anyway, <laughs> I'll probably talk more about that in a little bit, but passionate about accessibility in all its forms, I guess sort of sums up my response to that question. Okay. <laughs> Q is my favorite quote. Um, you'd think that I would have one of these kind of on lock, but I sort of had to think on this one for a while. Um, there are a lot of good quotes that I just sort of write down somewhere. One of my favorites is from philosopher Karl, Pop, Karl Popper, sorry, when he talks about the paradox of tolerance, sort of I don't know, this is kind of in the theme of accessibility and I have it written down here, so I'll just read it off to make sure that I get it right. He says, as part of a longer uh, essay or a longer quote, 
We should therefore claim in the name of tolerance the right to not tolerate the intolerant. Which can be a little confusing, but basically it's saying that tolerance in order to maintain itself must reject anything that opposes the ideas of tolerance. So fuck Nazis. <laughs> Um, sort of a sillier one that I also really love is from a book that I love very much called We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson, who you might be familiar with her short story, The Lottery. Um, and it is just, I believe it is just the first line in here, um, after the introduction, if I can manage to open this page. Okay, this is the third line in the whole book, and it hooked me. As soon as I read this line, I knew. It's like, yep, this is going to be one of my favorite books of all time. And it absolutely is. Here it is. I have often thought that with any luck at all, I could have been born a werewolf, because the two middle fingers on both my hands are the same length. But I have had to be content with what I had. <laughs> R is relationship status, and I kind of mentioned this before, but... I have a boyfriend, Sean, and we have been together for six, almost seven years, something like that. And um, we're at that stage where it's like, yeah, we're, we're boyfriends, but might as well be married kind of thing. Engaged to be engaged, whatever you want to call it. He's my partner. S is your favorite season, and I really love late fall and early winter. So the times when you're starting to get the first snows. I love Halloween. So it's sort of like, it's like Halloween, November through like early December. Um, I love it when it starts getting cold. I hate the heat. I'm not looking forward to summer. And this will be my first summer in, or I guess my second summer now in Boston. And I, um, yeah, I don't like the heat. I don't like the humidity, <laughs> um, but mostly just because it makes it feel hotter. Um, but anyway, I'm talking about my favorite season. And so the nice thing about Boston in the late fall is when the, like all the leaves get super bright red and then they start um, just dropping in these huge clumps and you get snow and I love the first snow. So anyway, T is tarot first and last. So um, that's the first tarot deck that you've gotten and the most recent tarot deck that you've gotten. My first one was my grandma's RWS and I don't remember what version this one's called. Plaid back, whatever, from the 70s. Um, I made a little box for this one too. I really like making the top closed boxes or whatever those are called. Um, so, you know, just this one. I inherited that deck when she died, sort of. Um, I liberated it from her state because I know otherwise it would have just gotten thrown out. Um, and I love it very much, even though it kind of smells like cigarettes and has a bunch of coffee stains on it. Um, I actually got the 1909 Roses and Lilies deck because this one has started falling apart and some of the, um, some of the cards were starting to get damaged from me using them. And so I want to preserve that one for more special occasions and just get a Rider Waite Smith I could be a little more um uh a little less cautious with a little less careful so anyway and the last one I got I um don't actually have it in my hands but the uh witchy cat tarot by Dame Darcy and I'm so excited about that because I have wanted a Dame Darcy deck for a while, a long time, like since I first saw them. And the thing is that the Mermaid Tarot and the Queen Alice Tarot, her other two decks, they just never totally grabbed me because of the themes, because I just kind of didn't care about the themes. But I love witches, I love cats, and I'll put some of the artwork up here. Um, it reminds me of zines, and I love the inking style, and it's, it, is sort of similar to my own art and I just I'm so so excited about it I'm gonna have to film a, an unboxing or something like that I know they're a little cheesy but I, I think I'm gonna have to do it because I'm just really excited about it
you, what makes me upset? Um, a lot of things make me upset. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the accessibility thing, actually. I didn't plan this, this uh, an answer for this one either. Um, it really, really frustrates me how... I mean, I pretty much already answered this question. It really frustrates me how much great information is just um, held behind barriers <laughs> so that um, people who don't have access to higher education can't access them. And it just feels so... It feels so awful that there's so much knowledge out there that is just only able to be held by elites and that's really why I work why I want to work in a public library and why I am working in a public library is just to to help lessen that divide and I really hate just I hate seeing the sheer differences that we force upon people by class and by wealth. V is vlog and it's supposed to be your most popular and your least popular. I haven't done enough shit yet to have a most and least popular or one that I'm most, oh so I'm sorry, it's it's most proud of and most popular. Um, I don't have one yet so I'm actually going to add a secret question to the end of this. So if you're still watching, you might as well hold out for the next few questions because I've got a special little bonus for you at the end. W is a weakness. Um, <laughs> I'm going to tell you what I use for job interviews or what I pretend to use for job interviews. <laughs> um, this is basically something that uh, a librarian told me when I was a volunteer and um, she was the librarian supervisor who was in charge of me. I came in with just a whole bunch of ideas of wanting to improve this uh, project that we were working on, which um, clearly were not within the scope of this volunteer job. That is like, they weren't, they weren't expecting a volunteer to come in and try to change things, and they didn't want a volunteer to come in and try to change things. So the librarian in charge of me and whatever just said that I sometimes have too much initiative, which is hilarious because I feel like that is totally one of those not really a weakness things that you could uh, bring up in a job interview. But in a lot of cases it is, it is true. I was very, very frustrated that I felt like I was trapped in this situation where I could see how it could be improved so clearly and it was just through this bureaucracy and this sort of arbitrary distinction of you're a volunteer therefore your ideas are not as whatever like not as valid or not as not as worth listening to you know, I don't know it just it that annoyed me so much so I'm really glad to um be able to <laughs> have a have a little more authority behind me I guess as a as an official librarian with an MLIS degree soon. X is X rated which is tell us something naughty you've done. I am ace. I don't do a lot of naughty things anyway so I'm just gonna tell you about one of the one of the naughtiest in terms of like one of the worst things I've ever done. Like the most arbitrarily worst thing I've ever done. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, so one time I was in middle school and I was waiting for the bus and um, you, there were a bunch of kids that were running around just sort of running back and forth in front of me and I got the most evil idea in my head of just what if I just tripped one of these kids? Just stuck my foot out and tripped. And I did, <laughs> just for no other reason than the fact that it was a completely sick, evil impulse. And I stuck my foot out and this kid tripped right over it and he barreled over it and landed on the sidewalk. And of course, as soon as that happened, I felt super, super bad about it. 
the kid was fine. He didn't get hurt. He didn't even have a scrape or whatever. He just picked himself up and kept running. I don't know if he even noticed that I had tripped him or anything like that. But yeah, that's probably that's probably the naughtiest thing that I've ever done. Not necessarily in X-rated terms, but like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why is yesteryear, which is your favorite year so far, and why? Um, and it's gonna sound a little weird, but 2020. And <laughs> it's really just because that's when I graduated from college and I was able to move out here to Boston and really get out from under my family's thumb in a lot of ways and start to um, step into more of myself and um, start a very long recovery process from a lot of things and, um, you know, just generally be able to focus on myself a little bit more. I mean, I've still had to work and deal with school and, and that sort of stuff, but just, you know, it's, I think it went really, really well for me overall. Z is Zen, or what I do to relax and stay calm. Like I said, I sort of have an issue with this. I don't necessarily get a lot of anxiety. I just, you know, hold on too tightly to things. And, um, and I'm a workaholic. And so I guess one way that I really like to relax is I like to watch bad or mediocre movies. Um, I'm watching one. It's called My Mother's on a Date with a Vampire. It has Carolyn Ray from uh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch in it. And it's, it's, it's really bad. It's not bad in the sense that it's like old monster movie bad, like, you know, Mystery Science Theater stuff is bad, although I enjoy that sort of thing too. Um, <laughs> it's, I don't know, it's mediocre bad. One of my favorite bad movies is The Adventures of Food Boy. It is a uh, superhero movie, food-themed superhero movie. Um, I highly recommend it. It is one of those things you just have to watch at some point, like like Rocky Horror. And the special double Z bonus prompt is zines, where I may not have a lot of blogs, but I have done quite a few zines. So I, rather than doing um, what my most popular vlog is and what vlog I'm most proud of, or video, I can't remember now if it was vlog or video, but anyway, I'm going to do what my most popular zine is and the one I'm most proud of. The most popular one is my death zine, which is the first zine in my uh, drawing room tarot series, which is basically, as I describe it on the back, an in-depth exploration of the death tarot card and related symbolism. And... Basically, it's sort of like half Persine and half um, informational, I guess, about tarot. So that's a self-portrait on the front. <laughs> um, you know, so the inside has information about astrology and how it relates to the particular card, like the death card is Scorpio. It has, you know, it, death in pop culture. And, or not death, but, you know, the death card in pop culture stuff on my life. And anyway, it's just like a nice, nice zine. And I've been really enjoying making the rest of this uh, series. I just finished my fourth one and I haven't bothered to actually put it up on my website yet, but uh, <laughs> it's all printed and stuff. And my most recent one is the Six of Swords. The other ones I've done are Knight of Cups and Judgment. So it's kind of no question, no surprise that death is the most popular one because it is a very goth card. It's a very recognizable card and just an intriguing card, I guess. So this is my most popular zine. And the zine that I'm most proud of, 
you are getting a special little sneak preview of because it's something that I have not released yet. I haven't photocopied and I probably will at some point, though I don't know when because it is a very personal zine. And it is called A Thing About My Dad Who Passed Away Six Years Ago or Six and a Half Now. Um, and this was basically a journal entry, the text of this scene anyway, is a journal entry that I wrote on November 18th of last year, which was the anniversary of his death, and um, has a lot of sort of altered pictures of my dad and um, gets into some really deep stuff about grief and about my relationship with my mom who was not a good mom <laughs> and the first sentence I guess captures the whole thing and so I guess I'll read it to you um I broke my no contact with mom to ask for some of dad's ashes so there you go that's the kind of scene that it is um and I'm really proud of this one because I've been I've been wanting to do a zine about my dad for a long time and I wasn't sure where to start and I think a lot of it was too emotional and this was very emotional for me to do. Um, even just writing the journal entry in the first place was very emotional. So I am I'm very proud of the scene. I'm very proud of how it turned out. I think that it ended up being rather therapeutic and at some point I would like to photocopy it and sort of share my story, you know, or one of my stories. So anyway, this is the one that I'm most proud of. This is my dad on the front, by the way, and um, this is a photocopy of a Polaroid that he got Well, he was in the Navy and, you know, he got to hold a lion cub, which is <laughs> super jealous. This photo is probably half of why I really love lions, but anyway, hope that's not too depressing a note to end on. Um, that was Terratube A to Z, or Terratuber A to Z. I really enjoyed this tag, even though I'm a little late in the game. I think this was like four months ago that it was started, but you know, that's okay. <laughs> and I, um, hope this helps you all to get to know me a little better. And I will see you next time. Bye.